Hello, everyone. I hope that you can all see my screen. Looks like we have a number of people joining the event, so it looks like Denise's introduction is probably wrapped up. All right. So without further ado, I will jump into my presentation. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for taking the time out of your busy schedules to attend this event. I would specifically like to thank Denise Ruffner, the founder and the president of Women in Quantum, and Andre Koenig, the chairman of One Quantum, for making this event possible. I am extremely honored to have the opportunity to speak amongst such incredible women and leaders and role models in this field. I could not be more appreciative to be here today to talk about my personal experiences with coming into quantum and sharing a little bit about INQ's technology as well. Additionally, I would like to mention that I would not be in the place that I am now without the support of fantastic colleagues, professors, teachers, friends, and family who have and who continue to support me as I pursue my interests. Oh, one minute, might be on mute. One moment, technical difficulties. All right, you can all hear me? Perfect, awesome. I will jump right back in monitoring the chat. Thank you all for <laughs> the immediate feedback. Um, and so again, just a big thanks to everyone who has supported me to help me to where I am now. I hope that I can similarly support others as they pursue their goals. I think that this organization and community is a wonderful avenue to celebrate the achievements of women in quantum and women in STEM in general. So with that being said, I am very eager to share my journey that led me to my current role and to talk about INQ's technology. Today's chat will cover my path to a career in STEM, specifically how I ended up at a quantum computing startup. When I decided to pursue an engineering degree and was studying mechanical engineering, I did not expect to be working in the field of quantum, but I'm obviously very excited to be here now. And then I'll transition to how some of my projects at INQ and talking about our technology in general. For the past three years, I have been a mechanical engineer at IonQ, and at a high level, my work focuses on designing, simulating, characterizing, and assembling highly precise and stable elements that make up IonQ's quantum computer. As you may imagine, the system is quite complex with many different subsystems and many teams collaborating together so that we can achieve groundbreaking results. Design requirements often involve minimizing disturbances to sensitive aspects of the computer. We at INQ, and I'll get into this a little bit more later, use a trapped ion approach to produce our quantum computing units, qubits, and the system needs to be extremely precise when you're pointing individual lasers at individual ions. Um, so of course, I'll get into more of those details when I talk about some of my projects and talk about INQ's technology in general. I studied mechanical engineering and business at the University of Virginia. University of Virginia, and I'm currently located in DC as INQ is based in College Park. Though you may imagine it was just a direct route from Charlottesville to DC, that was not actually the case. I took a job right after graduation in California before actually coming back to the East Coast to work with INQ. So I'll again talk about that a little bit later on. In my free time, I enjoy exploring my creative interests by creating art or playing music. Mumford and Sons coming on the scene when I was in middle school and high school really encouraged me to pick up banjo. And I also enjoy staying active and spending time outdoors. From a young age, I loved to make things. I wanted to know how things worked. Many of my fond early memories were working on some sort of craft or project and drawing and art were a hobby that I discovered very early on and still carry that enjoyment with me today. I found that I was happiest when I was creating things and uh, my parents very kindly indulged me with a craft bin of all the craft supplies I could ever want. Um, when I was working on projects or crafts, tape was my main tool because it allowed me to take these cardboard and paper creations that I made and made them actually feel like plastic because I manually laminated them with all of the scotch tape that I could find in the house. Um, and so, hence the craft bin and stocking that with as much tape as I needed. One night in elementary school, my dad and I got ice cream and went to the library. And I was often interested in those types of science books that focus on little experiments that you can do at home. And they're obviously targeted for different age groups, but mostly kids. And 
while I was perusing the library selection, I came across a book that thoroughly explained how I could build a robotic car using a Tupperware containers, the structural element to hold the electronics and the mechanisms that made the car work. And I thought, oh, if I look at this long enough and pour over the diagrams and explanations, I can make something that's probably the same as what the author made, or at least suitably interesting. So I definitely, as a third grader, was not the author's intended audience, but I decided to pursue the project anyways. I went to the local radio shack and bought some hobby motors and eventually constructed this car that you see in the slide out of an Altoids tin, and of course, an appropriate amount of tape for both aesthetic and structural purposes. So this project really, the same thing, in the same way that I enjoyed art, it allowed me to take this vision that I had in my mind and then turn that into reality. And that was something from a very young age that was very captivating to me and um, something that really eventually led me to engineering. Besides working on little science projects, I really came to love the creative flow that happened when I was drawing and painting. I would find that hours would slip away as I was working on a drawing or sketching. And I'm sure many attendees in the audience probably feel the same way about a hobby of theirs or hopefully with the work that they do. I know that I'm very lucky where I get into flow when I'm doing engineering work. And this flow that I discovered was something that was always a hobby and it was always a positive outlet for me. But as I continued to take more art classes, I realized that maybe I want to major in fine arts. This would satisfy that craving of making a vision and turning it into reality. And, um, you know, it was just something that I discovered from a young age and really enjoyed. But then in high school, I took a physics class and absolutely fell in love with the subject. I love the methodical process of solving problems and using math to do that and having all these equations that explained the world around me and explained why this answer to this problem set was correct. My high school physics teacher was absolutely fantastic. I cannot say that enough and thank him enough for pushing me into engineering. He expected the best from his students and encouraged me to take more physics classes and even suggested that I pursue a degree in engineering when he saw how interested I was in the subject. And thanks to the encouragement and the support of my teachers, my academic counselor, my parents, I ended up spending the entire summer before my senior year of high school taking an additional math course so that I could take physics my senior year of high school and the calculus that was needed for that. And things finally clicked for me when I realized that I could combine my passion for art and this new interest and enjoyment of physics and math by studying engineering, specifically mechanical engineering, because to me that was the specialty most conducive for making things. So I really was excited about that opportunity. Um, I also want to make a point that I was not the girl who always loved math. I have a very distinct memory when I was desperately frustrated in elementary school by either long division or multiplication. Something made me very frustrated. And I wrote in all capitals on a piece of printer paper, math, and stormed downstairs and ripped it up in front of my parents to show them how much I hated it. Obviously, my opinions have changed and they were changed by people who were exceptionally patient and kind and believed in me. And they taught me that I could work hard to understand and appreciate that subject. I also read a book in college called A Mind for Numbers, and the author does the great job of dispelling this notion that there are people that are intended for math. That is not true. And so often you hear people, male or female, say, I'm just not a math person. Numbers, they just don't click for me. And the author does a great job of explaining why this isn't true. I read this book when I was already in a STEM field, but I think it would be even more powerful for young women or any young person that's considering the field like me who used to hate math to know that you can have a mind for numbers. There are not specific people that are intended to do math. And I know that my experience is very unique in that I was never told that I was not a fit for a career in STEM. I was never told that I couldn't do math because I was a girl. And I hope that by sharing my experiences and mentoring young women and young students that I can share this powerful message that anyone can have a mind for numbers and there are people out there that believe that and that support that. 
As I mentioned in my introduction, I studied mechanical engineering and business at the University of Virginia. The mechanical engineering department was one of my very close-knit communities at the university, and I got to know many of my professors and guidance counselors in the career office very well. In the same way that physics for me in high school allowed me to envision the type of major and academic interest that I wanted in college, mechatronics was a class in college that allowed me to visualize the type of career that I wanted. Um, for those that aren't familiar, mechatronics is the intersection of mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, and software. And this is a field that's highly technical and involves this intersection and interplay of a lot of different engineering groups. And so that was the type of career that I wanted, one that was cross-functional, hands-on, and really technical. And I was, in, I was surrounded by very inspiring peers, supportive professors, and had the world of engineering at my fingertips. Uh, the department had a rapid prototyping lab, which I frequented, and that really piqued my interest in 3D printing. In addition to the wonderful experience in the prototyping lab and the excellent students and professors that I was surrounded with, one of the highlights of my time at UVA in the engineering department was my capstone project, which, though in the mechanical engineering department, had a very control systems heavy focus. The problem statement was simple, design and prototype a machine that was self-balancing. So my teammates and I decided to use inspiration from a one-wheeled skateboard that was on the market to see if we could create our own and control it. And like my mechatronics class, this project involved a bunch of different areas of engineering, design, manufacturing, electronics, control systems, programming. But what really made the project successful was the collaboration that our team had and the different strengths that everyone brought to the table. And again, this just reinforced the type of career that I was looking for, one that was dynamic, one that was cross-functional, and one that was highly technical. So after graduation, I took a full-time job with a healthcare company that I had interned with over the past two summers. And the job that I took was a development program designed to expose me over the course of a few years to various aspects of the company's business. And I moved, I, like I said, this wasn't a direct route from Charlottesville to DC. I moved back to my hometown in Chicago where the company was also headquartered and I did training and then eventually moved out to Santa Clara to start my first rotation. Unfortunately, my expectations about the amount of engineering work that I was going to be doing weren't really in line with the reality of the job. And I quickly realized that this program maybe wasn't the best fit for what I was looking for in my career. So I started applying for different jobs and came across this incredible posting at a quantum computing startup. They were looking for a mechanical engineer and the job description, though I didn't have any explicit quantum experience, um, the job description for the engineer was exactly what I was looking for and what I had envisioned when I was taking my mechatronics classes and my capstone class. So after a few interviews, I moved back to the East Coast. In early 2018, I joined IonQ and I joined the company when it was pretty small. I came in as the lone engineer on the hardware team, which had me feeling both excited and a little bit nervous besides a field trip that I had taken to Fermilab in high school with a uh, focus on a little bit of quantum, I didn't have any explicit background in quantum physics. Before starting, I wondered, for those of you who are Big Bang Theory fans, if I would be like Howard Wolowitz, the lone engineer amongst a group of brilliant physicists. And the scene from the show always gives me a chuckle that I included on the slide. Of course, the reality was my coworkers were absolutely fantastic in providing us non-physicists with Quantum 101 and being exceptionally patient as I jumped into the deep end and started thinking about mechanical engineering within the design constraints of a quantum computer. Joining a startup was a radically different experience than I was used to from the unique design requirements associated with engineering a high powered quantum computer to the speed the responsibility I was given and the creative freedoms under which we operated. I knew that this job was the right fit and this is what I was looking for. I discovered a new passion for precision mechanism design. This was, um, you know, a subset of mechanical engineering that I hadn't yet been exposed to, but got to learn more about and actually apply once I started my job at INQ. And I have since added this textbook amongst many others to my growing professional library, which again was what I was looking for as I was studying at the university and realizing I want to be in a really technical job. Um, 
working in such a dynamic environment with my colleagues allows us to wear a variety of different hats and get exposed to so many different projects and collaborate across the board on all of the different elements that built our quantum computer. Um, besides the fact that the company is building this fantastic technology, I really can't say enough about how wonderful the culture is that we have here. INQ is a brilliant and a supportive community that supports one another to achieve our shared goals. We, you know, from the ping pong table in the warehouse where I've gotten many lessons on how to play better table tennis to the pre-COVID lunches where we would all take a shared lunch break to sit shoulder to shoulder and laugh. This is a really special place and um, one that on both the technical and uh, cultural level is just a great fit. So now I'm going to transition a little bit to talk about some of the projects that I have had the opportunity to work on at INQ. Within the first two weeks of starting, I jumped onto a project that eventually got submitted for a patent application. The project involved designing an assembly to actively stabilize a laser cavity, and cavity length stabilization is particularly important for locking the output frequency of the laser. So you have two mirrors that this is a very, very simple explanation, but there are mirrors that are inside the laser cavity where a beam bounces back and forth. And if that length changes at all, and I'm talking on the order of nanometers or micrometers, you don't want to see that happen. And you'll see an output of your frequency of your laser change based on how that cavity length changes. And so the project involved a lot of mechanical design, dynamic analysis, control theory, design iteration, testing, and validation to ensure that what we were putting into the laser was actually stabilizing it actively. And it was extremely rewarding to see one of the first projects that I got to work on at INQ ultimately get submitted for a patent, which I think I can speak for many engineers when I say that this is a huge milestone and a big achievement for anyone in their career. Another aspect or another project that I got to work on at INQ was the system enclosure design for our next generation system. This enclosure that you see on the screen was actually featured in some news articles as we announced our next generation system, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And not only is the design, in my opinion at least, pretty cool, the primary function of the enclosure is actually to create a highly stable environment for a quantum computer. And so the enclosure limits the effects of temperature and humidity fluctuations, as well as significantly attenuating the acoustic environment that would surround the computer if it wasn't properly enclosed. And these types of environmental disturbances, if they're not managed properly, could have negative consequences on the performance of the computer. So it was, you know, very rewarding to get to work on this design where I was able to decide what do I want the computer to look like? What do I want people to envision when they search quantum computer and search that on Google? And so that was a really rewarding experience to get to work on this design and the execution of this enclosure for the system. Another aspect of my job is finite element analysis. And this is important for both analyzing existing subassemblies in the system as well as doing design iteration. And so this allows us to explore, at least my purpose is to explore mechanical behavior. So primarily I focus on deformations, stresses, heat transfer, and different modal behaviors of the system. And the images here look at the deformation of a vacuum viewport on our vacuum chamber. So very quickly summarizing it, when you pump down a vacuum chamber to ultra high vacuum pressures, you have this large pressure differential that causes bowing of a normally flat mirror. And so understanding what type of deformation is produced allows us to compensate an upstream optical system so that we are pointing lasers very precisely on the target that is our ions. Just minimize the screen, sorry about that. Um, and then as a brief aside, I another aspect of my job at INQ is rapid prototyping, which we occasionally do on 3D printers. I, since being exposed to 3D printing in high school, have been very interested in the technology and now I'm lucky enough to have my own 3D printer at home. And so this is a big upgrade from the cardboard and the paper projects covered in tape. I actually now have plastic filament and much more complicated designs that I can produce. So that's just a brief thing about 3D printing. So now I'm going to transition to talk a little bit about INQ as a company and give an overview about our quantum technology. 
For those of you who are not familiar, IonQ is a startup building trapped ion quantum computers. We were founded in 2015 by Jung Sang Kim and Chris Monroe and are now up to over 50 employees. As many attendees know, there are two typical approaches to quantum computing. You have the superconducting architecture to produce qubits and the trapped ion architecture. Obviously, IonQ is using the trapped ion architecture, given what I said earlier. And um, one of the reasons that we do that is because we want our qubits to be as identical. Our qubits are fundamental computing units for those that maybe don't have a quantum background. And we want those qubits to be as identical to one another as possible because it allows us to build reliable interactions when we run our quantum computations. And by using atoms that we ionize and hold in an ion trap, we have fundamentally identical qubits. And so that's one of the many reasons why we use the technology. As of August this past year, we announced the commercial availability of our 11 qubit system with our cloud partners. And so if you're interested in running a quantum algorithm, you can do so on the cloud platform. And we also announced our next generation 32 qubit system, as well as our upcoming technology roadmap for the next five years. So there are a lot of really exciting developments going on. And I encourage everyone after this presentation and after this event to check out our website to read some of our press releases, blog posts, and additionally, some of our technical articles if you're interested in that as well. I'd like to provide a bit of background before going into the steps of our ion trapping and quantum computation process. We ionize ytterbium atoms to produce our qubits, and ytterbium is a silver rare earth metal. We do this inside of a vacuum chamber with an ion trap, and we, since the, ion, or since the atoms are positively charged, we can hold them using electromagnetic fields above our ion trap, and this all takes place in an ultra-high vacuum chamber where you can see the trap in the center of that viewport. Taking a step back and looking at the system as a whole, there are a number of lasers that are used to trap, to prepare the qubits, and then ultimately to perform the quantum algorithms on those qubits. And this requires highly specialized optical systems. These optical systems need to be precisely aligned and controlled using very sophisticated software, electronics, and control systems. Additionally, the system needs to be robust to any types of external disturbances like vibrations, thermal gradients, acoustics, and a lot of the design and engineering work and analysis that goes into building our systems involves stabilizing the optical system and how we customize that. So as I, went, as I mentioned when I was going over my projects, that system enclosure is one of the elements that helps achieve environmental stability. The ion trap and the ion trap's connected structures are installed inside of an ultra high vacuum chamber, which further isolates the ions from their environment. Ultra high vacuum is necessary to reduce the potential collisions and disturbances to our ion chains. Any molecules and particles that are floating around inside of the vacuum chamber have the ability to collide with your ion chain, and that would collapse any type of quantum information and ultimately could disturb what's going on inside the chamber and require the quantum, the quantum computation to be started over. And so there's, of course, a lot of engineering work that goes into chamber design, chamber preparation, so that you don't have these background particulates in operation. So to ionize the ytterbium atom, a laser enters the vacuum chamber through a viewport and it strips an outer electron off of the ytterbium atom. Once that electron is stripped away, the atom is now ionized and is positively charged. We can then use that positively charged ion to, uh, in our ion trap, to produce magnetic and electric fields to stabilize the ion above the ion trap. And so one way to visualize the uh, trapping voltages and the electromagnetic fields that allow us to hold our ions above the trap is to think about a tennis ball on a horse saddle, which looks very similar to the image on the screen in the top left corner. If you were to set a tennis ball on a horse saddle, it would fall off the side. But if you were to start spinning that saddle around, the tennis ball would be trapped by the well that's created by the downward sloping and the upward sloping curves. And that's ultimately what we do with our ion trap. We use the different electrodes to produce this saddle-shaped electromagnetic field that oscillates very rapidly to hold these ions above the trap. Once we have one ion, we load a whole chain of ions so that we can run quantum computations on the entire chain. And once all of those ions are loaded, we use another laser in a process called Doppler cooling to 
freeze the ions basically in free space, essentially to reduce and remove all of the mechanical energy and vibrations that those ions have, even when they're held in the trapping potentials. And so this allows us to have less error prone and better quantum gates. And then finally, we use another laser to prepare the ions. And when I say prepare, that means, or the qubits, to put them in their ground or their zero energy level state so that every ion is initialized in the same way so that we can then start running quantum computations on those individual qubits. So after the ionization process, trapping, cooling, state preparation are all completed, we use another laser to perform gates or quantum algorithms on our ion chain. We use laser beams that are specifically tuned to excite the ytterbium qubits from their ground energy state to their excited energy state. And I often think of a quantum algorithm as playing a song on a harp where each string is a qubit. And by playing multiple strings at once, you combine the vibrations of the strings to produce a unique sound. So the analogy to quantum then is you're entangling the quantum vibrations and the quantum information between two qubits as you run the algorithm. So we are able to individually address the different ions in our chain to run the whole algorithm. And the song of the harp then is the quantum algorithm. One benefit of using the trapped ion approach is the complete connectivity between the qubits and the ion chain. Every qubit is able to interact with every other qubit because there are no physical wires that hold those qubits together. And because we're able to individually address the different qubits, we have a lot less computational overhead because we don't need to have intermediate computation steps to entangle the quantum information. We don't need to have an excessively large chain of ions to do a computation that with a similar or that a system that had a slightly different architecture that didn't have complete connectivity, we are able to have much less computational overhead. So that's one of, again, one of the reasons why we choose to use trapped ions as our architecture. So finally, once the algorithm is completed, we read out the results of the computation by shining a laser on the qubits and measuring the light that's emitted by each of these qubits. So the resonant laser, when we shoot it at the qubits, collapses the quantum information that's stored in between them, and it forces the qubit to exist in either a one excited energy state or a zero ground energy state. So the one qubits glow and the zero qubits do not glow, and then we measure that light that comes out of the chamber to read or to answer the quantum computation. Finally, we connect the entire system to very sophisticated control systems and advanced software to run calibrations and to perform high fidelity quantum algorithms on our computer. That is a very high level overview about how our technology operates, but um, you know, I can imagine that there are a bunch of different backgrounds with different familiarity with quantum computing, and I hope that the technology that I've described hopefully gets you excited about quantum. So with that, I would like to thank you all for your time and for this opportunity to speak.